maybe an early. One twelve, one nineteen. It's beyond this wall. Oh my gosh, this is going to run out. Hi, it's Nadia. I got to change the name here. The name. All right. She rocks. She logs in every Tuesday. Don't don't mess with her. Hmm. Okay. Say that again. Okay. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, those, who are, those who are here and those who are online, uh, welcome again to Bible study. Um, today we will wrap, wrap up this last study and then next Wednesday. Ooh, so I wasn't on yet. So today we'll wrap up the, um, this last study on eternal security. But don't worry if you weren't here. Um, I want to go back to it again. For, um, some of the stuff I talked about last week. Um, and then I want to continue. Um, and then next week, we're going to wrap everything up um, by just going through um, all just sum summarize the entire um, study, and then we'll have time to have some discussion and questions, statements, or remarks. So before we start, why don't we go before the throne of God? Um, let's bow our head and let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear Holy Spirit, you who are our Paracletus, who you are, who you who is our teacher. We ask you, Lord, that you may be with us. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Uh, Father, uh, you say in your word, we know in part, and we only prophesy in part. But you say only then we'll know fully. So, so Father, until then, we ask you, O oh God, that you may be with us, O oh God. And what we don't know, Father God, we pray, O oh Lord, that you walk in, O oh God, and, and teach us, O oh Lord, for you are the great teacher. Father, help us not to come to Bible study and learn your word and becoming, Father God, smarter sinners. But Father, help your word to regenerate us every single time that we open it, every single time we come together to study it, O oh God, for your word is true. 
So, Father, in your word is what gives life and life more abundantly. So, Father, be with us tonight in this Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome. I see some new faces, which is awesome. Keep coming. Um, Nadia's here. Uh, well, she's not new to Bible study, but um, she's new to this one. Um, Herman is here. Uh, I see Nana Jane. I see Lor Lorraine. I, saw, I see May. Um, if there's anyone else, I, yeah, see, I, I said Herman. I saw Herman. So if there's anyone that I don't see, uh, well, welcome to um, Bible study. Um, so, all right, so why don't we start? So like, as I said, this is our last um, subject on the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of grace. When we talk about the doctrines of grace, as we said last week, when we are talking about eternal life, whoo, this is part 12, so it's been like three months. Um, when we talk about eternal life, eternal security, what we are addressing is the salvation of the believer. We are addressing the salvation of the believer. We are asking, is the believer's salvation secure once and for all? Meaning, once the believer believes, the person comes to believe in Christ. Or is their salvation secure once and for all? Or can the believer lose his or her salvation after attaining it, after acquiring it? So as I said last week, what, whatever you feel, whatever you believe, or whatever has been taught to you before, or even tonight, does it really matter? What matter is what does the Bible teach about that? What does the Bible teach about the salvation of the believer? Does the Bible say it's a last, it's lasting, or does the Bible say that, uh, or, or does the Bible say it's lasting, it's enduring, it's interminable, or does the Bible says that? It's, um, it's temporal. But before we can do that, I said last week, we need to understand what salvation is. Before we can even talk about eternal security, we need to understand what salvation is because eternal, eternal life is a derivative of salvation. It derives from salvation. Uh, it comes before, salvation comes before eternal life if you are looking at it in chronological order. So you need to understand what salvation is. So what we said last week was, according to the Bible, Christian salvation, not just the word salvation, to save, Christian salvation is not just deliverance from sin. Yes, it is a big part of that. Deliverance from sin, it's not just deliverance from the wrath of God. Christian salvation is to be made alive. It's not just that you, your sin is forgiven. It's not just, it's not just that um, you, you will no longer face the wrath of God, but what it means is you have been made alive. You were dead in your transgression, the Bible says, but now you are made alive. Something, Ephesians chapter, uh, um, um, so, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, makes, th makes that very clear. It says, but because of his great love for us, not because of anything we did, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Did you hear that? God who is rich in mercy in salvation made us alive in Jesus Christ. So to be made alive means to be born again. You could hear that. It's either it says you are, you are made alive or you are born again. And to be born again is meaning that you are not the same person. You are a new creation. So Jesus did not die to make you a to make a newer version of Garvel. Jesus did not die to make a view, newer version of Sue. Jesus died to make a new creation. 
In fact, um, my, my favorite verse, um, the verse that I, I, I got baptized and that, that was my verse, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, if a person is in Christ, therefore, if a person is in Christ, anyone, they are a new creation. The old has passed. You may look the same to me. You may even seem the same to you, but to God, the old has passed. And everything becomes new. Meaning the moment that you believe in Christ, Christ made you alive, just as the psalmist says, as far as the heavens above, or as far as the east is from the west, he removes your transgression from you. Whatever you were in the past doesn't mean anything to God anymore. It is who you are now in him. So what, so to be born again, as I say, means to be made alive. It means to be given a total new life, not a makeover, but a new life. And Jesus made that very clear in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, the thief come not, but that he may steal and kill and destroy. But I come that they may have what? Life. In life, what? More abundantly. The word abundantly means never ending. More abundantly. I come that they may have life. So Jesus says the primary reason why he came on earth is to give life. So this is the question at hand tonight. When we are, when we're talking about, when we're talking about is salvation eternally secure once and for all? This, this new life that Jesus gave, is it secure once and for all? Or can you lose it? Well, the only way you can figure that out. And, and I've never known, I've never, um, you know, I've, I've never heard anyone talk about it in that way. And it's just something that the Holy Spirit just put in my heart as I'm preparing this Bible study. You have to study the nature. If you want to understand something, you have to understand the nature of it. The reason why you adore Christ so much is when you study the nature of God, that he's both man and God at the same time, that he was perfect. He lived this life and never sinned, right? You learn the nature. You say, ah, he is God. Or as the disciples said, surely this man is the son of God. So when you learn the nature of something, you can, you can know what it is. So what is the nature of this new life that Jesus said he came on earth to give? Well, I want to look at three aspects of the nature of this new life with you. I want to look at three aspects of the nature of this new life with you. And I believe this will, this will help us answer the question we are asking. Is the believer's salvation secure once and for all, or can you lose it? The first aspect we looked at last week, we said... This new life is a gift. That is the first nature of this life. It cannot be earned. It cannot be, it cannot be worked for. It is a gift. Everyone who received this new life must receive it as a gift. If you work for it, you can't get it. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, make it very clear. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, right? We said we're going to look at what the Bible says about the nature of this new life. So the first aspect of the nature of this new life is that what? It is a, a gift. What's, what, what, uh, what's more is that it says it is by grace. What does grace mean again? Unmerited favor. 
unmerited. So this is a gift, an unmerited gift. You can't have any merit to receive that gift. You did not work. You cannot work for it. You did not work for this new life. It is the gift of God to you. That is why Romans chapter 4, verse 4 say, understand what we're saying. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So you get that. When you go to work, every first in the 16th, you get a check. You don't go into your boss's office and start kissing him or her all over, saying thank you or worshiping them. Because you think what you, what you get, you work for. So it's not a gift. She's not doing you a favor. He's not doing you a favor. In fact, if you're like me, you think you're worth more. When you look at your check, you're like... So, so what, that's what Romans chapter 4 verse 4 is saying. The moment that you think you worked for it, you had to do something to get it, you forfeit that gift. It's no longer a gift. It's what? An obligation. And God will not be obligated to anyone. God will not owe anyone anything. So it is a gift. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift but as an obligation. But, but Ephesians 2 tells us that it is a gift, so therefore, you can't work for it. If you have to do anything to get this new life, then God would be obligated to you. So, since it is a gift that you did not earn, Romans chapter 4, verse 5 says, however, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly. Their faith is credited as righteousness to the one who does not work. Those are the people that could earn the salvation. So knowing all this, the question I now have for you is this. If when Jesus gave this new life to the believer, he gives it knowing full well that the believer is undeserving of it. Is it logical to believe that in order for the believer to keep it, they need to be deserving of it? How, how does that make, logically speaking, we are, the reason, what makes us human is that we can think logically. If when Jesus, when he's, when he's going to give us that gift, he says, I come to give you this gift, this gift, this gift, eternal life. And you're not deserving of it, and I'm going to give it to you. So if he knows that I'm undeserving of it, and he gives it to me, if he requires that when I get it, I need to be deserving of it, that does not make sense. Does not make sense. So this new life is an unmerited favor. It's an unmerited gift, undeserving gift. So just as you were not responsible for it when you receive it, guess what? According to the Bible, you are not responsible to maintain it. Or see it through the end. Now I know some of you have a little question mark in your head. Because you're talking about what, then what is the responsibility of the Christian? We'll talk about that at the end. But I just want you to understand this aspect here. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, this is what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. This salvation of, our, of yours, this new life that Jesus come to give, you can be confident of this, 
that he who began that work in you will do what? Will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Who gives it? God. Who carries it to completion? God. So I'm not telling you anything out of the mouth of Pastor James. I'm telling you what the Bible says about salvation, about this new life. That it is he, you can be confident of this. That it is he who begins this good work in you. He himself will carry it into completion. He'll see it through until Jesus come back. The word used here for finisher. Com uh, um, completion. Um, sorry, th th there's another text that says, if, if, um, if you can look it up for me, he is the author of the finisher of your faith. What, what, what's, that, what's that verse? Which one? He is the author and the finisher of your faith. If you could grab your, your phone and just put author and finish your faith, it'll, it'll pop up real quickly. The author, finisher of your faith. Anyone who's home, if you could get that for me. I had it with me this afternoon. I totally. Hebrew 12, uh, 2. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Actually, I have it right here. My eyes are no good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, her. So Hebrew, so Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, they're being confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it into completion until the day of Jesus Christ. But Hebrew chapter 12 verse 2 says, when it comes to salvation, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Did you hear that? He is the author. The author is the one who originates this, right? And he is the finisher of our faith. Now, the word used here for finisher is the Greek word tele, um, tele, te, teleotis. Teleotis. And that word is only used once in that way in the New Testament. This word specifically refers to Jesus as the one bringing the life of faith to its completion, to its conclusion, to its consummation. It is that same word he used, but in the perfect tense on the cross, when he says, tetelestai, it is finished. All is accomplished. So meaning I'm done with what, I'm, what, I'm, what I came to do. So with the same thing here, uh, um, the, 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 the author of Hebrew is saying, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. So this gift can only be obtained by grace through faith and in Christ alone. So that's the first aspect of the nature of this gift. Right? Let's talk about the second aspect of the nature of this gift. We talked a little bit about it too last week. The second aspect of the nature of this new life that Jesus gives is at the core of everything the, this Bible study is about. We can say it is the culmination of everything we have been talking about since we started. According to scripture, this new life that Jesus gives is not just an unmerited gift. In its very nature, it is eternal. It's, it's, on, it's an undeserving gift. It is also eternal. I come that I may give life. What kind of life did Jesus give? As I told you last week, there's a few things I want you to pay attention here. In John chapter 6, verse 4, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the one who believes, 
what? Has eternal life. The one who believes has eternal life. There are two things I want you to pay attention here. As I told you last week, Jesus is saying eternal life is front-loaded. Meaning it's not something you're going to receive later on. He didn't say we'll have. And then we're going to see every verse that we look, keep it in the present tense. He who believes what? Has. Present tense. The moment you come to Jesus, or let me put it the other way, the moment Jesus draws you to him, according to our Bible study, you have eternal life. It's not like the, the house you bought or the car you buy. No, the title deed is in your hand. You have eternal life. So the eternal life of the believer is a present reality. But there is something, it's not just that it's present, it's a present reality. But secondly, eternal life means what? Lasting, existing forever, without end. Let's look at, let's look at a few more verses. So eternal life means lasting. It means existing forever. It means without end. It means it's interminable. You can't terminate it. In John chapter 10, verse 28, 29, Jesus says, I give them what? There is not a place in the Bible where he said he gave life. It wasn't eternal. I give them life more abundantly. I give them eternal life. He who believes has what? Eternal life. You don't get temporary life. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus gives temporary life. He gives eternal life. And guess what? Listen to the text. I give them eternal life and what? And they shall never perish. Jesus is lying here then. If we believe the believer could lose their salvation, Jesus is lying, you're telling me. You're calling Jesus to be a liar. I'm, if I believe this, I'm calling Jesus to be a liar. Because he says, remember we just say he says, has eternal life. Eternal life is front low. So if you can have eternal life and lose it and perish, Jesus just lied. Because he says, I give them eternal life. Not I will give them. But I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. He says, according to me. And not only that, no one can snatch them out of my hand. I'm not willing to let them perish, and guess what? No one can Snatch them out of my hand to send to, to bring them to perdition to perish. And he says, not only my hand, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Not only they can snatch them out of, so, so we are both in Jesus' hand and in the father's hand at the same time. You're in great hands. Jesus in this text says that the nature of this life that he gives is eternal. Whomever he gives it will never perish. Whomever he gives it to will never perish. 
What does the most famous verse, John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave them temporary, gave them his son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have temporary life. No, but have eternal life. Whosoever, again, it's saying it opposite. This one says, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. He who believe, they shall never perish. Why? Because they have eternal life. In John 5, chapter 24, Jesus again says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. You hear that? Not will have. Or has eternal life on condition that No, period, has eternal life. Oh, but guess what? If this front life is truly front load, it's in the present. And he says, whoever believes in me, who's, who, and sit in, in me and the one who sent me has eternal life. And what does he say? He will never be judged. Never be judged. It's either Jesus is lying to us, or he doesn't know what he's talking about. But if he knows what he's talking about and you trust what he says is true, then you better believe it too. I give them eternal life. They believe in the one sent me. They shall never be judged. That's why, that's why David said, blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Never? Why will those whom Jesus give this life cannot, will, cannot perish and will not be judged? Well, he tells us in John 6, verse 40. In John 6, verse 40, Jesus says, for my father's will, it is my father's will. And this is talking about, remember what we talked about, the decretive will of God. The decretive will of God must come to pass. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believe in him shall have eternal life. And I will, what, what does he guarantee again? They will not be judged. I will raise them up at the last day. He's not a man that he should lie. Mm hmm On? Oh, there we go. Um, is the word shall have a future word or a present word? It, it, it's a present word in the sense what he's talking about. He says, for my father's will. So he's saying, when my father decided to do it, this is how he decided to do it. Okay. That even though it happened in future past, right? That that before the creation of the world, he decided that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ will automatically have eternal life. Okay. So that was a decision that was made. Remember, he, remember he, he, um, he predestined us before the foundation of the world. So what he's saying right now is saying, when my father decided to do this, he did it with this will that anyone who believes will have eternal life. Not saying that when you believe you, and then you will have, no. Because it's, the, the, the Bible cannot contradict itself. If, if it did, then there would be problems. And he promised to raise us in the last day. Now I'm leaving Jesus' word. Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, to reaffirm the nature of this new life in Christ. He says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, do you see the word gift again? So the nature of this gift, the nature of this life is a gift. But another part of its nature is that it's eternal life. But the gift of God is eternal life. Not temporary, not on a probationary base.
John, John affirms that as well, not just Paul. Now let's go to John, 1 John chapter 2, 25. And this is what he promised us and promised you as well, eternal life. This is what he promised us, eternal life, not temporary life, eternal life. Jesus doesn't give any other kind of life, but what? Eternal life. Not life, again, as I said, on a probationary basis, not life if you remain good. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 12, he says, so remember he says, this is what he promised us. But now they're saying, and this is the testimony. God has given us what? Eternal life. I'm going to say it until you're tired of it. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this is life on his, in his son. Whoever has the son, what? Has life. No, whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son does not have life. 2 Timothy chapter, um, um, 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. He says, fight the good fight. Therefore, then, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of what? The eternal life to which you were called. What were we called to? Eternal life, not temporary, not on a probation basis. Eternal life. You made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Did you hear that? Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called to when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So the moment you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, that my, my sheep knows my voice, and when I call them, they come to me. I'm not, it's not just, mind you, yes, it is supposed to be confessed. If you confess with your, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved, right? It's not saying just anyone who comes in and make a confession, but saying the one the Father draws to him. Or like they said in, in Acts, those who were appointed to eternal life that day, believe. So Jesus says, the question is, so, so this is it. The question is, if the life that Jesus gives every believer when they receive it is naturally eternal, is intrinsically eternal, how can they lose it? How can you lose that which cannot be lost? If any believer can lose it, it would mean that this life in its very nature is not eternal, but temporal. If it, could, can, if it can be cut because of something you've done, then this life Jesus gave intrinsically is not eternal. Therefore, the, the person himself who received that life is the sustainer of that gift. But that's what we're saying. We're saying that life can only be eternal if we do something right. But if we don't do something right, the life is not eternal. I'm hearing a feedback. I don't know if it's my, my... So what, in the second question I need, you need to ask is, what kind of giver would God be? You have a question? Go ahead. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you, so is the church then in error when, let's just say someone, you know how they say you backslide, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you come to church and they say, we dedicate your life to Christ, is that an error or? Yeah, well, again, I don't think it's an error, but we know in part and we we, we, like I always say, we know in part as the Bible says. We don't know fully. Oh, oh, it's not like God tells us this is the number of the people. Or when you come, God says, Holy Spirit whispered to the, to the pastor and says, okay, he's saved, she's not. Right? So the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher has to do his or her job. Right? How can, how can they come if how can they how can they hear if there's no preacher right so so those are church lingo that that's what we do ecumenically right it's an ecumenical thing right we talk about rededicating your life to christ but we don't know if that person was saved before that even though they were in church i'm going to show you something very soon or the person may have been saved and in some way being dragged away. And then the church is saying, what, what, okay, remember when in, in, in the book of Corinthians, Paul talked about a man who was having an affair with his father's wife in the church. And no one was saying anything about it. Paul says, I want you to excommunicate this brother. Kick him out of the church. When you kick him out of the church, it's not to throw him away. It's in a sense because the person who, the, the person who loves God, the person who's a believer, they cannot do without the fellowship of the sin, without the coming together. He says, when you do that, he will spill that boy. So they did that. They kicked him out. But what did he do? He repented of what he was doing wrong. In the church refused to take him in. Paul had to write them again. Paul says, listen, the reason why you did this was to entice him to come back in. So we don't know. And also, Carlene, uh, to your point, I was kind of thinking along the lines of when a pastor offers someone to rededicate their life to Christ, it's it's more like a prodigal son coming home moment than it is a I need to get saved again. They are already saved. Backslidden just means they sinned, which we all do. So it's not a losing of your salvation. And now you need to come back to your salvation. No, it's just a confession of sin and rededicating saying, you know, I, I need to confess my sin and maybe refocus, but it's not necessarily a get saved or again re, moment. Re -saved. That's not what right. I mean. Now, this is the, the other thing. Actually, I'm glad that you take the example of the prodigal son. Even though he left, even though he did all these things he did, he was still called a son. The father said, my son. The father didn't say, well, you need to do something else to become son again. Whether he was aware or he was near, he was still a son. He might be a prodigal son. He's still a son. But guess what? The son will come back home. The true believer, no matter what happened in their life, will come back home. So if this new life longevity depends on the action of the receiver who did not even deserve it, we saying that this life intrinsically is not eternal. This life that Jesus gave is not provisional. It's not on a prohibition, prohibitionary basis. 
It is interminable. It is something that is permanent. It is enduring. Now, let's address that part. How about those who were with us that fell away? The brother that was dancing around. The brother that even preached on the pulpit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Pay attention with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. Could you pay attention to that word? You see, it wasn't, it wasn't at the end in the text. I said at the end, so we could, we could stay there. I never knew you. He didn't say, I knew you at the time when you believed, but then you did something wrong that I, I don't know you anymore. He says, I never knew you. But yet this person was prophesying in his name, was casting out demon in his name, and do mighty work in his name. If this if somebody who's done this thing is not saved at the end, doesn't have eternal life on that day, it's because what? He never knew you. Because again, what does the book of Romans say? This new life that Jesus gives is not by the will of man. It's not how much you want it. It's not how much you will for it. It's if he predestined you for it. So Jesus in this text here never said once that, well, I knew him or I knew her for a little while. Yeah, for a little while. Yeah, for a little while you were walking with me. But, and then I knew you, you were saved. You had salvation. But then you did, then you walked away from me. Then you did this crazy thing. Then you, then you forfeit your salvation. No, he says, I never. You know what the word never means in Greek? <laughs> never. They <laughs> both same in Creole too. Never. I never knew you. So when we are teaching these things, and, 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 and I'm not judging. Then that's why the Bible says, study your word to show yourself approved. A man and a woman rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus didn't say, I knew you for a time. No, I never, never know you. I never, I didn't know you. I never knew you. So, so then Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. Well, let me start with 31 first. You could keep 31, 39. What then shall we say in response to all these things then? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God says no one can snatch us out of his hand, who can snatch us out of his hand? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Did you hear that? God has chosen. Not the one who comes to God, but God has chosen. What then shall we say? 
in response to all this we've been talking about, about the nature of this life. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen to be his own? Well, it can be, no one can do it because it is God who justifies. How can he justify you and then judge you? Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Did you hear that? He's at the right hand of the Father in the closest proximity interceding for you and me. I guess this is the same thing that just happened here when he said to Peter, I prayed for you. The devil was sifting you uh, to destroy you, but I prayed for you. Why didn't he pray for Judas? Remember I asked that. Because he was not of his sheep pen. He wasn't the sheep pen, but he was not of his sheep. My sheep knows my voice. They obey. Yes. So when he chose the 12, Judas was part of the 12. Correct? Yeah. So... Did he just choose Judas for the sole purpose of fulfilling God's word? Yeah, we've been talking about the sovereignty of God, right? <laughs> yeah, he says, he says, then, was that, then he says, was that the one who chose the 12? But yet one of you is a devil? That's what he said regarding Judas. He says, yet one of you is a devil. So again, that brings back to what John says. They, they were among us, but they were never with us. If this person that believes does not have eternal life. They could be among us, but they were never with us. So he says then, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conqueror to him who loves us. For I am convinced of this, that neither death, nor life, neither angel. Remember, no one can snatch you out of his hand. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand as well. No matter what happened to the Christian, do you, do you know that in, in, during the time of, the, of, of, of um, um, when, when they were persecuting the Christians, they used to put them in the, in, in the Coliseum, um, how you said? Coliseum. Coliseum. And bring out lions to devour them. All they have to do is renounce the name of Jesus. But they rather go to their death. And it's not them. It's him. It's not them. It's him. Nothing, neither height nor death or anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because this new life that he gives to you and to me is eternal, never ending. And Apostle Paul tells us why we should be persuaded. What Jesus is saying, what the Apostle Paul says about this life is true. He says in first, because of what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5 says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. He says, this is what Apostle Peter says. Praise be to God and Father and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth, this new life, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from death and into an inheritance. Listen to it. The nature of this new life, this inheritance, and into an inheritance that can never perish, no matter what happens, spoil, no matter what you do, fade. 
This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. How can you lose something that's not in your hand? It's out of your reach. It is kept for you in heaven. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So some people call this study, eternal security, some people call it the perseverance of the sin. Like the sense of persevering. I call it the preservation of the sin. Not the only one, but there are other. The preservation of the sin. Because it is he who began the good work in you that will carry it into completion. So you're not really persevering, although you are, but he's preserving you until that day. Isn't it what he says in, in Revelation? He cut the days short for the sake of who? For the sake of the elect. He cut the days short. He will do everything he has to do in order not to lose you and me. Romans 8 verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now the question you can ask is how can that be, one might ask. How can that be? How can that be? Well, condemnation isn't the same thing as judgment. It is, yeah. So it doesn't say that we'll never be judged for our sins. It just says we won't be found guilty because of Christ. You won't be found guilty. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why we're going to. God, your, God, what does the Bible say? God disciplined those whom he loved. When the Christian does something wrong, they will be disciplined by God. We will be disciplined by God. And let me say it. We will, dis we will be disciplined severely. But we're talking about your salvation. is not affected. That's what the God said. It's like when our child, children do something. As long as we are, well, when our child become independent, we can't ever become independent of God. When our child or our dependent, they could do whatever they do. We could spank them, we could put them in punishment, we could take whatever, but they still remain a, our child. Still stay in the house. We still take care of them. Sometimes I don't believe this guy that makes me so upset is going in my fridge to eat all that I bought. <laughs> <laughs> and when they use a Sharpie on the walls. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 5, um, could you just bring 20 to 21 for me? I, I'm not going to read the entire thing. So, he said, Apostle Paul, the law was brought so that the trespass might increase. Right? The law was brought so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, what happened? Grace increased all the more. What does that mean? Where, where sin increased, that's the reason why you just, where sin increased, God's grace increased all the more. You can't ever cancel it out. Your sin can ever cancel out what God set out to do. Now, there are two different things, though. I, I, maybe, maybe I'll take a little bit, maybe 10, 15 minutes to talk about that uh, next Sunday as we close, close this. Eternal security is not the same thing as assurance of salvation. You may be unsure of your salvation, but does not mean that you're not you know, eternally secure. Am I saved? Am I going to heaven? 
that's your problem. You, 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 could, you could not sleep all night, but if, if God chose you, you are eternally secure. So you could, you, could be, you could live like a poor person while you're rich. That's what you're doing. So Pastor Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20 to 21, just as, but where sin increased, God, God grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But after Pastor Paul summarized that eternal life remains abundant, because the more sin increases, grace increases all the more. Apostle Paul said, mm -mm, wait a minute. He anticipated, he anticipated that people are going to think and say, well, if that is the case, we might as well live our life as we please. If there is no condemnation, then we have a carte blanche. It's a free for all. For those who believe, we could go ahead and just live our life however we, we want. Question. And, yes. I didn't mean to interrupt, but. No, no, the, go ahead. Interrupt all the time. On this Always point, interrupt me. On this point right here. So mm -hmm. can you reconcile quickly how we get from, uh, we were dragged to our, where we became, what you know, we were talking about with grace, because of grace, we were dragged to the point where we uh, <coughs> um, came into the saving grace and, and, and the salvation and this reconciliation. But yeah. at the same time, the same hand that dragged us and yet uh, how are we, we're, we're a new creature, we're a new creation now, but how can mm -hmm. our thinking persist? How can how is it that Paul still has to speak to people about previous thinking and previous lifestyle persisting now in light of this same grace that dragged them to this newness of life? Could you repeat that last part? Yeah, so I'm just trying to reconcile. How is it that, or can you at least reconcile the notion that it was, we were dragged from our previous condition to come into the, the knowledge, into the new life, right? Into the newness, yeah. and becoming mm -hmm. a new creation. And yet, Paul is speaking to people, to the people here about not continue, continuing in, in sin. You know, heavens forbid that you continue, can you live in sin and be a license to sin. How do you reconcile those two distinct kinds of thinkings? Especially, yeah, we are still, go ahead, go ahead, finish. Especially since, like we said in the beginning, I agree with that if we were dragged. It was of our own volition. We would never come to a, a, a safe relationship and and being regenerated and being born again. We would never do that on yeah. our own. We have to be dragged to it. But then again, now in maintaining it in our, in our walk, it seems like it's on us to kind of choose not to go back and, and behave in the former way. Yes, because now you're free from sin, right? So, so before you were slave to sin, but now you're no longer a slave. That's why James says, and the Apostle James says, when you sin, it's because you choose to sin. You see, before, you, before, before Christ, you didn't, have, um, you didn't have an option. But now that you are in Christ, you have an option. But remember, Apostle John says, if we say we are without sin, we make Christ to be a liar. As long as you are in this body, even though you are not a slave to sin, you will still be fighting with sin. You will still be fighting with sin. And then sometimes you let sin, you, you hear the word? You let sin. Before, Apostle Paul says, who will save me from this body of sin? Right? The, the things I want to do, I don't do. But what I don't want to do, I do. Why is that? It's because I'm a slave to sin. That's before Christ. He didn't say, what's going, what, did, what do I need to do or what's going to save me? He says, who's going to save me? Talking about Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives his son, Jesus Christ, 
that when we become a believer, that we can fight sin. But remember, our salvation is positional. Right? We are saved positionally. We are righteous positionally because we have not yet been made perfect, as Apostle Paul said. But when that day comes, we say goodbye to sin forever because we're going to give up this body. It is this body of ours that makes sin have any type of uh, 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 influence in our lives. But, but on the last day, at the twinkling of an eye, those who are dead will be cut up to meet in the air, but those who are still alive will quickly change, and this body will be gone. And God will give you a heavenly body that has nothing to do with sin. In that day, you will be away from sin forever. But as now, you're still battling with sin. However, I'm glad you asked this question because this is where we're transitioning on the third aspect of this salvation, of this new life. Right? The nature, the third aspect of the nature of this new life. I'm going to take a question from, Herm, did I, did I answer you? Yes, thank you. Okay. Put, put in your mouth. Yes. In lieu of what Herman was just asking, in Romans um, 3, 23, it says, for all have sinned. So, because we are still in this falling body, we do come short of God's glory, but it doesn't, you know, negate the fact that Christ has already done his job. Yeah, we're talking about salvation. There's salvation in, in the, the daily life of the believers, right? So what, what the Bible is saying is that the salvation, the, the life that Christ gives is eternal. He doesn't give temporal stuff, life. He gives eternal life. And we read it all over the Bible. Go ahead. Somebody was going to say something. No, just to be clear, the distinction I was making is that was just, or was trying to reconcile the notion again that yeah 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 no yeah. no i know that i know that i know that yeah go ahead Garvel. so so as i was you know so as i was listening to so as i was listening to herman um the reconciliation part that i think that um he was alluding to is the the whole process what I was thinking is the sanctification process, that uh, sanctification is in fact a process. Yes, we're saved, but how do you reconcile the being dragged and the doing what you want to do, where you just quoted Romans 7 or 8, where the things I want to do, I do not yeah, do. Yeah. Um, so there's a sanctification process. And one of the things that I just keep coming back to throughout this study is, uh, is um, 2 Peter 1, 10, where it talks about um, being sure to make your calling and election sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, that we, we constantly have to walk in such a way that we're checking ourselves. We're walking mm -hmm. circumspectly and um, always checking our walk in the Lord. So yes, we're saved eternally. We cannot lose our salvation. But while we're going through the process, we still have to die daily to our flesh. Yeah. We still have to crucify our flesh. We still got to pick up our cross and follow, and follow him. Christ. So all of that is part of the process of sanctification. of sanctification. Yeah. So 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 you guys want to segue into what I'm going to kind of talk about, right? So this is where we're going. So what I'm saying is it's exactly Paul. Guess what? Paul in, Paul anticipated that, right? That's what I'm about. To, that's what I'm saying to you. Paul is saying, "Whoa, we we're sin increase, grace increase all the more." Then people will say, "When? We, how do you reconcile this? Then do we go on in sinning and we're still saved?" Uh, we can't lose our salvation. In fact, I have had this discussion with respected teachers of the gospel, people I have great respect for, who told me that they don't teach eternal security um, because they fear it will be used as a license to sin. Oh, no, many, many people don't, many pastors don't do that because of that. Yeah. So in, in, in uh, I, I don't know which epistle it is, I believe it's uh, first or second John, where he talks about um, something to the effect of not continuing in sin. I think it's right around where you were talking about um, uh, if we say we're not, if we say we're without sin, then we make out, we make God to be a liar. Mm -hmm. One John um, three six. Okay, so so 
uh, he says that we don't sin intentionally because if the spirit man of, is within us, if the Holy Spirit indwells us, then we no longer want to sin. And if we do, we get it right. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't continue going on in that same thing over and over. We're constantly repenting. We're constantly turning back to God. We're constantly giving it over. And that can go on till the day the Lord takes us home. Yeah. But until that happens, if we're in a position of repentance, if we're seeking God's face, fasting, and, and really going after him, then we're not choosing to live in that sin. Yeah. So, so let me continue so you guys get a sense, right? So let me continue. So, but the third aspect of that, the nature of this new life, right? So, so, so as I said, some people don't teach it because they, they fear of the fear that then people will go on and sin. But Apostle Paul brought that concern to light in Romans chapter 6. Let's, we're not going to read all of it, but let's take verse 1 to 4. <clears throat> what does Apostle Paul say? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Right? Isn't, isn't he answering, answering that question? He says, where, where sin increased, grace increases. He says, whoa, 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 I got to make this right. Because people might think they have a license to sin. He says, shall we go on sinning? What then shall we, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. And other death, Jesus Christ was um, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too live what? A new life. The Apostle Paul is now addressing the third aspect of the nature of this new life. He's saying not only the nature of this new life is an undeserving gift. Not only it is a never-ending gift, but the nature of this life behooves allegiance and intimacy with God. It behooves it. If you have that new life, guess what? You yearn intimacy and allegiance to God. You don't look to sin. You yearn it. That's, it's not because of you. It's the nature of this new life in you. And that's the reason why the true person, the person who truly has received this gift from God, if you were to sin, it will, it will hurt you to the core and you, you can't sleep. You can't do anything because you know you're not right with God. And it may even be a sin that when you, before you were saved and you were a slave to that sin, you might not have even considered that a sin. Like you and swearing, Pastor James, you've told us this story so many times. You used to say all kinds of bad words before you were saved. Yeah. Once you were saved, you just stopped doing it yeah, and I, didn't I, even. I didn't even know. You I didn't curse at home. She didn't know. Yeah, but I <laughs> well, she was friend. little. She was little. But anyway. My point being that when you're a slave to sin, you don't even consider what you're doing to be a sin. Yeah. Then when you're saved you're and you acknowledge, exactly, but you now, acknowledge that it is a sin. Now, that's now it I breaks tried. your heart to do those things. It does, you don't want to and you feel bad about it. You never felt bad about it before. Yeah. So the nature of this life that Jesus gave automatic, automatically leads you to righteousness. If that's not a sign for you, so if you're here, whether you're online or you're here in the building, if as a Christian, your life is not, oh, as the psalmist says, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul long after you. If your life is not painting after God, painting after righteousness, you need to ask myself, am I saved? That is what Jesus says about eternal life in John 17, verse 3. Listen to what Jesus said. This is what eternal, what is eternal life? Eternal life is not a long thing, although it is long. Just like I said, salvation is not just about um, saving from wrath and sin. Jesus says, now this is eternal life. 
You're going to know when you have eternal life. That what? Amen. That they may know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is eternal life? Knowing Jesus. That they may know you. I never knew you. But that they may know you. The verb that is used here is the Greek verb ginosko. The word ginosko is a euphemism for intercourse. Right? It's a euphemism for intercourse. Right? Remember when the Bible in Hebrew, the Bible used the same word in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Adam knew Eve. You hear that? What is it saying? Adam had sexual relationship with Eve. That's what it means. It's a way of saying, it's like instead of, people, people use the euphemism now all the time about sin. Then people don't say I sin anymore. They say my foot slipped. slipped. That's a euphemism. No, you sin. So they didn't want to say Adam had sexual relationship with Eve. They say Adam knew Eve. Well, Adam knew Eve and she became pregnant. Whoa, what do you mean by that? And gave birth to a son? Right? Adam knew Eve. So the word, the, the, the word ginosko, actually, um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife in ginosko, and they become one flesh. So what is eternal life? Eternal life is that they may ginosko you, that they may have intercourse with you, that they may have intimacy with you. One flesh. That they may become one flesh with you. So you can't say you're saved and not have one flesh with him and not ginosko him. This is the greatest relationship someone can ever have with another. And that's the reason why Jesus says, if you sleep with a prostitute, guess what? You ginosko her or you ginosko him, you become one with them. So that's the reason why, so that's the reason why we need to teach eternal security. Not in a way to fear, because yes, this the, it's about the nature of the gift, the nature of the, the, the nature of this new life, it's an undeserving gift, it's a never-ending gift, but it is a gift that behoves you to goodness for God. If that doesn't happen, you're not saved. If you're not, like David says, when can I go to be, when can I go to be with God? I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Or like the psalmist says, as for me, my foot had almost slipped. When I look at the life of the unsaved, they have everything. But then I went to church. I went to the sanctuary and all that changed. Oh, I saw the Lord. Salvation behoves you. Salvation requires that. The nature of this new life in you, it spurs up what? Righteousness. Remember, remember what, what, what did the text say at the beginning? Why, why, why couldn't we come to God? Because the mind governed by the flesh is what? Hostile toward God. But when that person received this life that Jesus gives, it brings love toward God. Everything that God says, he or she become a yes man. I love the way they put it in some churches. If God says it, 
I believe it, and that settles it for me. No more question about it. That's the person who has the gift that Jesus gives. What you said? Some people cut out the middle. They said, if God said it, that settles it. That's, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I believe it or yeah, not. Yeah, it doesn't matter if I believe <laughs> it. Cut the middle out. But the Christian automatically believe it. If God says it, I believe it. Because you know what? Listen. What you believe dictates how you behave. I've said this before in this, this church doing Bible study. What you believe dictates how you behave. A lot of time I'm hearing politicians say, well, you know, I believe, that's my belief, but I'm not going to do this. No, <laughs> no, that's not true. What you believe dictates how you behave. Do not love the world, John says, and the things of this world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If you love sin, the love of the Father is not in you. Because the nature of this new life behooves you to ginosko God, to have intercourse with him. To become one with him. So this new life is not just an undeserving gift, not just an enduring gift, but it is life with God. It is passing from death to light, from darkness to light. Where you no longer want to live in sin anymore. Go ahead. Go ahead. Me. Hello. There I'm back. Uh -huh. I just need you to reconcile something for me. So if as we know, we're hostile to God before we, before we know him. And if, as you said, our behavior dictates, our belief dictates our behavior, how then could there be people casting out demons in his name? How could there be people performing miracles in his name? If they're hostile towards God and their behavior is dictated by their belief, they wouldn't want to do those things. They wouldn't they wouldn't do those things, and yet they could do those things and wanted to do those things. So how then could Jesus say, I never knew you? But that has nothing to do with love. That, that has nothing to do with loving God and being went, casting out demons. Um, I, I'll, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll bring you someplace in Haiti where they cast out demons, where voodoo people cast out demons. I mean, but that has nothing to do. What I'm saying to you is sometimes. Well, they don't Jesus, do it in Jesus' name, though. He said, in my name. I, I agree with that. What I'm saying to you, Jesus says, well, again, that's exactly what I'm saying. This new life is not just about having a power to do or to say things in Jesus' name. It's to know him. It's to have a relationship with him. Without that relationship, it doesn't matter what you do. You could pastor a church all you want. In fact, when, when I, when I, when I. When I took, when I, when I took Hebrew, uh, intermediate Hebrew at Harvard, I used to go and sit in a class in a New Testament, Old Testament or New Testament, Old Testament class from a guy who say he's an atheist. I mean, because Harvard have a divinity school, not a seminary. Man, this guy was the best I've ever heard. But, but is he known by Christ? That's the difference. That's what we're saying. And that's the reason why it's not how you behave in front of Jen or inside the church. It's knowing that there is an eye that is on you. That is a, there is a God that has a relationship with you. He sees everything. He knows everything. And it only matters to him how you live your life. And, but guess what? This, this, it's not even you 
this this eternal this life that Jesus gave if you truly have it you cannot live in sin Pastor James yes yes I had a couple of questions on that same verse that um that Jen brought up and or at least maybe a couple of theories but it says in it, on that day, many will say to me, did we not prophesy? Well, just because yeah. they say that, that does that mean that well, it's true? They could be saying they prophesied or saying they casted out demons, but in his name, but that doesn't mean they actually did. I, I agree with that as well, May, but let's say they did. But let's yeah. say they Weren't there you... people, yeah, weren't there people who were actually preaching and Peter said, hold on, whether they're doing it for the right reason or the wrong reason, Christ is being preached all the same. But but it doesn't serve them any any good. Right. Christ is still being preached. Right. But it doesn't serve these people any good. Right. Right. So so May, to 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 piggyback on what you're saying, yes, they're saying uh, they, Jesus says they will say to me, yes, it's true. But let's say they did it. The, the devil is, is, is tricky as well. The devil is tricky as well. So, hmm. so could it be that they were being used? But if they did, could it be that they were being used by the devil? There's a possibility, right? Um, but, but as Mary said, Jesus didn't say, you did it in my name. He said, many will say. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Whether you did or not, that's your business. I, I never knew you. You're not part of my sheep. Yeah, because I, I, I'm thinking about other parts of scripture where the, um, where the Pharisees are accusing uh, Jesus of, of doing works in the name of Beelzebub. And he said, how can the demon cast out demons? He would be working against himself so work, work in the same them. light right so in the same light how could the people if they're not christ's then then they're on the other side and how could those on the other side cast them cast out that demons in his name yeah yeah right. no i totally agree i totally agree with that and and i will stand firm on what you just said yeah i mean again and sometimes that's the reason why we can't run through scripture right um because as May said, many will say. He didn't say many cast out in my name. Many will say. Right? right? And that's very important. And there's a reason why even a period in all karma in the Bible is there for a reason. Every single thing. So yeah, many will say. So they're faking. If if they're if they're trying to cast out demons in Jesus' name, they're faking it. If yeah. they're not saved, and it it probably didn't happen. It probably didn't happen. But they'll say, "Didn't we do this? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these good things for you?" Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know. I'm not there. I don't know those people. What have you? But all I know is that he says many will say. What I'm saying is, it right. can be applied today to tens of thousands of Americans who call themselves Christians because they go to church on Easter and they, they're not a uh, Muslim and they're not Jewish. So therefore they're Christian and they might believe in the story that Jesus came as a baby, but that doesn't actually mean that they knew him just because you say something, just because you say it right. doesn't, doesn't mean, mean you're dead. You're known by God. Yeah. Okay. So like when I said, so I maybe that's really the point of the, okay. of the verse. That is the point of the verse. In, in other words, coming? many people will claim, many people will claim that they're Christians that are not really Christians. Yeah, and, and, and Connie, right before you speak, and that is the reason why you would see Jesus in his ministry often did things to push people away. And while the church is trying to lure people in with whatever gimmicky we want to do, gimmick we want to bring inside the church, and we have a big cloud, we think we're doing the work of God. Not saying that, big, don't, please don't go and say, Pastor James said, if they have big crowd, they're not preaching the word of God. Not, not at all. I'm not saying that. 
What I'm saying is you may have a big crowd, but does it mean that you're doing the work of God? If you're not preaching, if, if you're doing like Apostle Paul says, preaching a gospel that is no gospel at all. Go ahead, Colleen. What I wanted to say is, you know, with Jen's question and what may add it is that God, Christ's name holds power. So no matter who is professing the name, the name holds power, you know, outside of whoever is professing it. So they could have prophesied and healed people and chast uh, cast out demons in Christ's name because the name itself holds the power. Not the person doing it, but the name. Well, I don't know about that, though. Let me tell you why. Because in Acts, um, where in Acts did, so there was, uh, yes. You know, I, um, um, came to the demon and says, I cast you out in the name of Paul's God. Um, you know, and, and, and the demon responded and said, well, Paul, I know. <laughs> but who are you? He jumped on him and devoured him. Right? Paul, I know. But who are you? God, I know God. I know Paul. But who are you to say you have power to cast me out? He jumped on the man and devoured him. So because he wasn't part of the camp, the sheep camp, he could not profess the name of Christ, which is why the demon came. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that the people won't say it. It just might be that they can't actually accomplish yeah. In Jesus' name. Mike. Oh, Colin with the mic. Okay, go go ahead, Scott. I, I think that I think that everything that the discussions that are taking place right now with the women uh, ties in back to what you were saying. Whether, like you said earlier, I don't know I wasn't there if they had or had not. But the third point that you brought up is having that intimacy. Yes. And Christ was saying, depart from me, I never knew you because you never knew me. Yeah, we never had, you know, we never, you know, school each other. Intimacy. There was never, there was never none of that. Yeah. But yet you're saying you're doing these things in my name. Yeah. I think that kind of is a summation of what you was trying to say and what May was asking, kind of brings it all together. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, and that's the reason it is this ginosko, it is this knowledge of God, this intimacy, this, 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 this new life that behooves you. You, it's just not something you cannot not do, right? You just cannot not do. Um, um, jo Joseph, in, you know, Joseph was able to say, I can't do this to my God, to Potiphar's wife. I can't do this to my God. I'm sure that has nothing to do with Joseph. It has to do with the life that he was given. That life does something in you where you can't no longer go against God. You no longer hostile toward God. You no longer go against what God says. He makes you obedient to Christ. This new life brings about obedience, complete obedience to Christ, lordship. Have you ever heard people say, don't just look at God as your savior, but also as your Lord? Everybody wants Christ to be their savior, but does everybody want him to be their Lord, their master, rule over their household, their money, their life, their sex life, everything. Christ is Lord over. Now, even, you know, that's what, that's what behooved Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, King, King. King, we, we, we know you have power, but the God we serve, there's something in us that say we can't bow down to you. But even David, right? After David sinned and was made known of his sin, that's what makes him write Psalm 51. Because if the Christian sinned, those who are truly, who truly have that life that Jesus gives cannot live without repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Yes, I did it. I sinned. I didn't sin against uh, um, Uriah. Uriah. 
Uriah, against you and you alone. Because my relationship, this spiritual thing is mine with you. This intimacy thing is between you and me. No matter what I do with someone else or what have not, it's to you ultimately, and I know it. Have mercy on me. Against you and you alone have I sinned. So that's what brought David because the person who has the life that Jesus gives can no longer live in sin. And that's the reason why the Apostle Paul says what? For to me, to live is what? Christ. That's what this life does for you. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is, is gain. What you said? Yes, to me, to live is Christ. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. If I live, nevertheless, I live. But who? Christ lives in me. Romans chapter 6, verse 22, that's my last verse. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slave of God, the benefit you reap leads to what? Holiness. And the result is eternal life. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin, because now you have that new life, and have, you have become slave of God. The benefit you reap from that is holiness. It leads to holiness. And the result is what? Eternal life. Now let me ask you. Can the believer lose his or her salvation? Or are they eternally Secure. You're not eternally secure because of you. You're eternally secure because of the nature of the life that Jesus gives. If you have ever had it once, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. Because this life, yes, it's undeserving. It's undeserving when you got it. It's undeserving when you have it, and it will be undeserving when you get to heaven. It will always be undeserving. And it's not temporal. It's not on prohib a, a prohibition period. It is, for, it is enduring forever. And lastly, shall we go on sinning because we know that? No, because that same very life that Jesus gave its nature is to bring you to holiness. How can you live in sin? You can't. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ wants us to know this thing. He doesn't want to keep you, he doesn't want to keep you and me on the chin. Oh, let, let me, let me, let me not let her know that she is, you know, her, her salvation is secure. Because if she knows. She's going to run into sin. No, no. The salvation that is in you leads to holiness. That's what Romans 6.22 says. It leads you to holiness. It leads you to ginosko, to this intercourse with God. It doesn't, it doesn't make you say, I want, to, I want to go live in sin. The, the, the life that Christ gives is an undeserving gift that you cannot work for. It is enduring. You can't lose it. And because, because you have it, and because you know you have it, if you have it, you will never, never, ever, ever, ever again once you experience the goodness, it's like the psalmist says, oh, taste and see. 
that the Lord is good. If you have taste and see that the Lord is good, you cannot go back to sin. Apostle Paul says it's like a dog go back to his vomit. Just like the dog doesn't do that, you know, you, as, as a believer, the one who has the life of Christ, you won't want to do that either. So the Christian is eternally secure. And we don't have to be afraid. You are free to live your life. Not only knowing that you are eternally secure, but knowing that you have the assurance of your salvation. That's what's important. The assurance of your salvation. Well, it's, it's past 8.30. It's 8.39. We will wrap up next week on this study. Um, and, then, and then next week, I will let you know. I, I'm working on two Bible studies. So, so, so I'll let you know which one yeah, you will vote. <laughs> no, I've been, I've, been, I've been doing my devotion in the book of John. I was thinking about doing the book of John, um, but I also would like to do um, a series on salvation, talking about justification and, and predestination and all, you know, um, sanctification and all this part of salvation. So we'll talk about that next week and see which one. Which one you want, right? Yes. Um, so right before we go, anyone else have a question, statement, or a remark? Online or here? All right. So let us pray. And forever know that we are eternally secured in Christ because he who begins the good work in you, he will see it through himself. Father, we thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you, Father God. It's a, it's a humbling experience to know that this life that you put in me, I did nothing to deserve it. It's not because I was better than my neighbor. It's not because I'm better than the next man who doesn't have it. It's not because there was anything in me that was good. But it's because, Father God, you chose me and you before the foundation of the world. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that this salvation, you are the author of it. And you are the finisher of it. You complete it. Father, yes, I need to persevere because perseverance builds character. But my perseverance has nothing to do with my salvation. It's my preservation, you preserving me, you at the right hand of the Father interceding for me over and over and over again. And now I can be sure of my salvation. And everyone here can be sure of our salvation. That we don't have to be afraid asking ourselves, if you come tomorrow, are we going to go to heaven? Because you say your spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We know, we know when we are saved. Because your spirit bear witness to our spirit. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for that day. And thank you, Father God, for still keeping me, still preserving us, oh God. Father, I pray, Father God, for those who are heading home from, from, from the building. I pray for traveling mercy. And I pray, Father God, that this is not the last time we visit each and every person here visit these studies. That, Father, we may learn it, Father God, so we can, you entrusting us with this so we could um, share it with other men that will teach other women and teach other men, oh God. Lord, give us, Father God, more of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for uh, attending.
Um, see you next week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. God bless. You're welcome.